some of us, truth be told, we have an anger problem. We, we react. We have a short fuse. There's more door slamming than kind words being heard in our home. And if that's you, life's, life's too short for that. Let me encourage you to, to get help. If you have your Bibles today, we're being, we've been looking at a, a little passage in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Colossians, if you're like, where's Colossians? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company. That's how I remembered it as a child years ago. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. What are we putting on? Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. I have to make a confession. Each week as we go through these topics, it's been really hard. I'm preparing to preach, give a sermon on compassion. And God's like, Kyle, you, you got to be compassionate. And then last week I had to preach a sermon on humility. Holy cow, very difficult. And this week it doesn't get any better. I have to speak on patience. So I'm looking around the room. Nobody's leaving. The sermon's on patience. Have you ever prayed for patience in your life? What does a follower of Jesus look like? Paul's writing this from prison to a group of people he doesn't know, to a church that he didn't start. The church was started by Epaphras, but he got word of what was happening in the church. And they were chasing some other things in the church. And he calls them back to, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it looks like. You clothe yourself. We're going to put on some clothes today throughout this series for all kinds. What are we putting on? We're putting on compassion. We're putting on humility. And for some of us, that means we have to take off some things. Prior to putting on these things, there's some things that we need to take off. Right out of the gate, patience is the decision. I'm going to give you a lot of definitions on patience because it's just that type of word. It needs a lot of defining. Patience is a decision I'm going to run at someone else's pace. I'm not going to run at my own pace. I'm either going to slow down and run at somebody else's pace or I'm going to speed up and run at their pace. But this also includes our Heavenly Father. This is running at the pace that he's asked me to run. It's running at someone else's pace rather than pressure him or her to match yours or to even pressure God to match your pressure or to your pace. What's the opposite of patience? Now, the easy answer would be, well, it's impatience. Yes, it's, but there's, there's something else going on. It's often anger. It's often anger. Anger shows up pretty quick in all of our lives when, when we are impatient. You think about our reaction to things that don't go according to plan. When I commit, and when you commit into that drive through lane, there's no backing out, right? You don't know if it's two minutes or if it's 25 minutes. You don't control how long that drive through lane is, but you're committing. But then I react as soon as it goes over five minutes, right? Now I'm reacting to something. Listen, enter that drive through lane like it's going to be 30 minutes every time. The key to happiness in life is low expectations. That's golden. Let me repeat that. The key to happiness, the key to more joy in life is to enter into relationships. It's to enter into meetings, enter into conversations, enter into passing your resume out. All of that, enter it with low expectations rather than expecting you're going to get everything you want in life. 
because that has not been my experience. My guess is it hasn't been your experience either. There's, there's two Greek words that translate patience in the New Testament. The first is hupomene. It means to hyperstand. It means a, to remain under. And what are we, we remaining under? We're remaining under. I'm standing under. I'm going to remain standing under the pressure and the weight of what I'm going through. It could be that line that I'm waiting in. I'm going to remain strong. And it's waiting. Patience is not just waiting, but it's waiting with a good attitude. Anybody can stand in the line, but to do so with, with a good attitude, as if everything is okay, to remain under, to stand, to hyperstand. But the other word shows up a little more often. And this is the word, two words coming together to make one. Macros is long, and the other word is temper, thumos, macros, thumos, right? King James translates the word patience into, maybe you're already there, you're ahead of me, long suffering, patience, to suffer for a very long time is what patience is. It's not just to wait, to go deeper than waiting. It's to actually you're suffering while you wait. You're suffering for a short time, short suffering. No, long suffering. I want to warn you when you pray for patience, you're praying that you would suffer for a really long time. That's what you're asking God for. God, would you help me to suffer for a really long time? That word, thumos, temper, long temper. How many of us can our spouse say they are long tempered, right? That's described God. God is slow to anger. How many of our spouses, if we're married in the room, would say are, we are long tempered? How many of us, our friends, if we're single in the room, our friends would say, we are long tempered. I think the reality is most of us would have somebody saying, no, we're probably more on the short tempered side, right? Short suffering. I can put it up with it for five minutes. I can put up with it, but we all have a limit, right? I mean, come on. We all have a limit. In the movie, maybe 10 years ago, there was a movie that came out called Bridge of Spies. Tom Hanks, one of our favorite actors, my wife and I, uh, from an acting perspective, he was in that movie. He plays the lawyer, and he defends uh, a spy. He's being accused as a—he's a Russian spy. And they're having a conversation, and the spy, Rudolph Abel, says to Tom Hanks, James Donovan, who, James Donovan in the movie, he says, you remind me of someone. He's like, I remind you of someone. Who do I remind you of? And Rudolph Abel says, this one time I was at the age of your son, our house was overrun by partisan border guards from growing up in the Soviet Union. Dozens of them. My father was beaten. My mother was beaten. And this man, my father's friend, he was beaten. And I watched this man. Every time they hit him, he stood back up again. So they hit him harder. And he still, he got back up to his feet again. I think because of this, they stopped beating him eventually because he just kept getting back up. They let him live. Stoida Mutsa. I remember them saying, forgive my Russian for anybody who speaks Russian, but translated, they called him standing man. That is, that is a really close definition to this Greek word of patience, standing under pressure, standing under suffering, but it's more than just, just stand, standing. It's, it's waiting with a positive attitude. And then my question is, what are you waiting for? What are the things in life that you're holding on to, holding out hope for? And I want to start by asking, are they things that you expect or are they things that God has promised? Those are two very different categories. There's a lot of books being sold and churches can be filled pretty easily by telling you that God has promised you a lot of things that he hasn't promised. In fact, Following Jesus is a whole lot more about suffering than it is about getting a lot of things in your life. And so ask yourself the question, the things that you're really longing for and waiting for, are those promises from God? 
In Hebrews chapter six, we're told that Abraham waited patiently. What did he wait for? The land, the land that God was going to promise him one day. The Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of fame of faith. We're told of these people who spent their whole life waiting. They're waiting for significant things, things that God has promised them. There's things you and I have, we're waiting for. We're waiting We're standing firm while we wait for the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. He's coming back. And today we all are asked to have patience. Hang in there. Don't sacrifice the eternal for the temporal. He's coming back. We are are actively waiting. We are told to have patience for God is going to send his son again. Some of us are forging God's signature onto promises that God never made us. And it's easy to do. But God, there's many things God has never promised us. So I want to ask you that question, you, between you and God, what are, what are you maybe waiting for that God's like, I, I never promised you those things. There's plenty of things that God has promised. If we pursue something that will not ultimately fulfill us, It will increase our anxiety in life. It will increase worry and anxiety and fear. There are things that some of us are waiting on that are really unobtainable. And if God allowed the worst possible thing to happen to his son, then I think you and I, if we're going to follow him, can expect some suffering in our life. What can we expect from God? To suffer. Some of us, a short time, but for some of us to suffer for a long time. We need to hear that. We need to be reminded of that. Impatience runs rampant in our culture, doesn't it? Uh, Impatience. In fact, if there are two companies selling the exact same product, you know which company is going to put the other one out of business? the one that can deliver it to you sooner than the other one. We can have things, we can order things now in the morning and it's at our doorstep by noon. And sometimes we complain about how long we had to wait. We are such in an impatient culture. Patience is also simply another way of putting the other person first. Patience is an expression of submission. You first. Let me step back. You go first. Abraham waited patiently, received what God had promised. There's a, there's a middle ground I want to spend a few moments talking about. There's a middle ground that it's between things are going really well in my life and crisis. The middle ground is what we're told in Scripture should be a time of waiting and a time of patience. 400 years between the last book of the Bible written and the beginning words of Matthew. The nation of Israel waited, they're called the 400 silent years. That doesn't mean God wasn't speaking and moving and acting. It means we don't have written revelation for those 400 years, the 400 years of silence. And we're in patience over five minutes when we have to wait. 400 years. The Bible is full of people who waited many, many years for God to cash the check on his promises, for God to deliver what he said to be true, right? 40 years in the wilderness. Now, there's many reasons for that, but number one, they didn't stop and ask for directions, but 40 years they wandered. Can you imagine working for seven years for your wife? That's commitment. That's dedication. And then not getting the woman you thought you were getting and then having to work another seven years. The Bible's a book of people waiting, long suffering, waiting their entire life. Noah worked and preached for 120 years. And we're told in Scripture in James, not one person repented. 
Not one person joined him and his family on the ark. Talk about long suffering. He went out there every day and he, he preached 120 years and nobody responded. And we get frustrated when something doesn't go our way in such a short amount of time. But God, you promised me this. And we, we give it a week or we give it a month. Or maybe some of us, we've given it a whole one year. And yet God doesn't, doesn't work according to our calendar, right? For some of us, the encouragement today is just keep waiting, hang in there. We know how it ends. When, when Jesus returns, every one of your problems will be made right. Every one of your problems either will go away or will be made right. Every one of them. Every conflict, every problem that you have in your life, when he returns and we look up and we see him, it's all, God, it's all good. Hang in there. God is doing a work. You can, count, you can count on him to fulfill. The Christian has unparalleled resources when it comes to patience. I, I want to follow up on this middle ground. What, what researchers are showing about more and more within our culture, and typically young adults, but not just young adults, this is true for anybody, the gap between everything is good to crisis is, is shrinking. One day, everything in their world can be really, really, really good, and the very next day, they're in crisis mode. What happened, what we would call years ago, this period of patience, wait, wait, stand strong, don't react to what everybody else is saying and doing, stand strong, stand strong. We live in a consumer capitalistic society. So every business and every media outlet and every is a, aligning to our impatience. It's appealing to our impatience. Technology is appealing to our impatience. The number of things now that we can do with just simply a click of a, of a button. But to fully embrace impatience means I need to delay satisfaction, right? So not just be patient, but what would it look like in our life to choose to suffer, right? You walk into a store, you walk into a local pharmacy, aisles and aisles and aisles of medication to make us feel good instantly. And if you read the labels, it's, you know, within five minutes, within an hour, it's going to last this long. Immediate relief. What would it look like as followers of Jesus to choose to be patient, to choose to suffer? Four areas real quick. I'm just going to walk through four areas where we all can practice patience in our life. The first is, is just generally life. It's just life. If we shared a cup of coffee, I'm sure... I would share stories and you would share stories that life did not go according to your plan. You're not where you thought you would be many, many years ago. And we would say, hey, this happened to me. It was completely out of my control. Everything we really want takes longer than, than you want. The Olympics are coming up. And some of those events are going to last eight seconds and they spent 15 years preparing for those eight seconds, right? A gold medal is not something you just choose and wake up one day and say, I want to get it. It took sometimes a decade of delayed gratification for them to achieve gold. Life. Uh, personally, I remember uh, being asked this question. Uh, so you have a career and, and mine's been in, in vocational ministry. And I remember when I was a youth pastor, somebody, the kids would always come up and ask, when are you going to be a real pastor? <laughs> and then a number of years later, I was an associate pastor and they're like, so when are you going to be a real pastor? And then I was a, I mean, I've a lot of different pastors, right? As a family pastor, associate, as a campus pastor at my last. And the, and the question, the common denominator, no matter what I was doing, is when are you going to be a real pastor? And it was a, attributing real to, oh, preaching, right? It's 28 years before God so graciously gave me an opportunity to preach. 
And you've been so gracious letting me figure this out as we go. But sometimes I'll, I'll meet with young individuals who are entering ministry and like, hey, can I, when can I preach? Well, let me tell you my story. What are you doing in 28 years? You know, the first thing, let's, let me give you a broom and you can go sweep the parking lot. And after five years, then, then we can move on to setting up some chairs, right? And that's true, that's true in your, your profession and whatever God's called you to do. Maybe you wanted to get to where you are a lot faster, but it just took a whole lot longer. Life. The second is people. Not telling you anything you don't know. Relationships take patience, don't they? There's two extremes when it come, comes to people. Sometimes we call people out way too quick. And the Bible tells us love covers a multitude of sins. There's a lot of times we don't, we don't need, we're raising children in our culture now to be aggressive and be assertive and speak up for yourself. And, you know, don't let them treat you that way. Well, the Bible says sometimes you need to let love cover a multitude of sins. You don't need to call everybody out for everything. Yes, there are times as followers of Jesus, we need to stand up and speak for injustice. Yes. But a lot of the things we're talking about, we call people out, are not acts, great acts of injustice. Right? And so it takes patience. We need to be patient with other people. People have been patient with me, and I need to be patient with people. And let's have, let's go back to the middle ground to have time from everything's good before it's crisis mode. Have patience, long suffering. The third category is literally suffering. Suffering is a category that the Bible tells us. If you follow Jesus, you will suffer. It's not a box you check to say yes or no, would you like to or not. You will suffer. As we're, we help people find and follow Jesus at Boulder Mountain. If we're following Jesus, ultimately, where does he end up? He goes to the cross. So there's going to be times you and I are going to choose to do things that really, really hurt that would make no sense as you talk to somebody who's not a follower of Jesus. It just wouldn't make sense. And you have, you have conversations like, why would you do that? And you shouldn't do that. But Jesus says there's a better way. To choose to suffer. The prophets throughout the Old Testament, they kept preaching. They weren't perfect. But when they were beaten down, when they were ridiculed and mocked, they just kept preaching. They ceaselessly spoke God's word to unheeding and abusive audiences. Job, the book that's all about suffering, he just kept praying. When he was knocked down and beaten, he just got right back up. And listen, this didn't look beautiful. You read the book of Job and he's yelling and he's crying and he's asking God all these questions. That's what it looks like. But he kept persevering and he kept standing back up. Suffering. Life. We're required to have patience in life. We're required to have patience with other people. We're required to have patience in our suffering. And finally, we're required to have patience in our relationship with God. Failing in any other areas because we failed in being patient with God. God is at work. Trust him. He knows what is best for you. He knows what's best for you more than you know what is best for him. So you can trust him with your life. Be patient with God. Jeremiah was thrown into a cistern. You want to, there's a reason Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. It was, it was, he lived a really difficult life, constantly being ridiculed and beaten and thrown into a well. Je Jeremiah chapter 38, you can read that. He was thrown into, he got back up again. Elijah was so worn out from his fight with Jezebel that he wanted to die. Daniel was thrown into a lion's den by a king who was his friend. Daniel, when he was thrown into the lion's den, it's believed he was around 85 to 90 years of age. We 
we hear Daniel and we think, oh, he's a teenage boy. No, that was the beginning of his career. He served under what we would call eight presidencies, both sides of the aisle, different nations. He was the one constant. And he kept getting back up again. When he was thrown up, he kept getting back up again. Perseverance and patience. Patience is not just standing in line. It is to be active. It is a verb. Hebrews talks about, let us, church, let us, followers of Jesus, let us what? Run with patience. So you have two things going on here. I'm waiting for God to do what only God can do, but I'm not just sitting around. I'm doing what I can do while God does what he can do. You run with patience the race that is set before us. What does that look like in your life? What does it look like for you to be clothed with humility or with patience? Patience is not just the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting. And one minute of patience can lead to 10 years of peace. When I look back in my life, there's been times of great conflict. It's because somebody reacted. And that's somebody's me sometimes, right? And you can think of times where we reacted to a situation rather than waiting patiently, rather than saying, no, you, you go first. The relationship that God has with his people all throughout the Bible, God is called a patient God. The reason Jesus has not returned yet is because he is patient. He is tarrying because there are people who do not know him. He's waiting. Jesus is patient, and God is patient with sinners. Romans 2 verse 4 says that God's patience leads to our repentance. Romans 9 22 points out that only God's patience prevents him from destroying the objects of his wrath. God has been so patient with all of us. 1 Peter 3.20 points out that God had immense patience with the evil people of Noah's day, delaying judgment as long as possible. Today, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. I mentioned Job earlier. Job says, uh, Job's a fascinating book when it talks about the suffering and the pain, and he, he questioned God, right? And maybe for some of us in the room, you just need to hear, it's okay to question God. It's okay to bring your questions to him. He can handle it. God is big enough for all of your questions. But how did he answer Job's questions? He answered Job's questions with questions. Questions like, were you there when I created the foundations of the world? This is what Job 23, 9 through 10 says. When he is at work in the north, I don't see him. Job's saying, there's a whole lot of things I don't understand. There's things happening all around the world that I'm not aware of. I don't know, right? That's the submission. God, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm going to trust you. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him, Job says. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. God is building character in all of us as we wait and as as we suffer. In the book of James, when he talks about suffering, James chapter 5, be patient, my brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the yearly and the late rains. Right? The rains this is a really dry land. This is the brother of Jesus writing a really dry land. There were only two times you could plant. One was the spring rain, one was the fall rain. And if, if you didn't do your part or you got anxious or you reacted because, oh, I better put my seed in the ground. I better start sowing my seed. Then you would miss out. You do what you can do so God can do what he can do. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Be patient. The most patient person to ever walk this planet, his name was Jesus. And he could be called the standing man as well. 
because nothing deterred him from what God had called him to do. He was beaten and he didn't react. He was struck and he didn't respond. He continued to stand. He continued to walk. He continued to carry the cross. He continued to go to the cross for you and for me. Incredible patience. It takes patience to love people like us. Imperfect. And there's no limit to the patience that God has for you. He's willing to, to wait. What have you reacted to recently that just, just in this moment, you can, you can confess to God, God, I'm sorry, I took matters into my own hands. We all have that point where we reach it and we say, God, you, I don't see you moving, I don't see you working, so I guess I have to go do this and this and this, rather than, than do the next thing he's asked you to do, the very next thing. Don't do the next 20 things. God told Abraham to go. He didn't even tell him where. So what did Abraham do? He went. The Bible is a whole book about being patient and waiting. And in that waiting, you see God move and work and build character. What would it look like for you this week to let somebody else go first? Let somebody else step in. And you say, you, you go first my life for you. Humility, patience, compassion, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, packed full of the clothes that we should put on as a follower of Jesus. What does that look like? For some of us in the room, we've, we've wrestled with being long-tempered or short-tempered, forgive me. Some of us, Truth be told, we have an anger problem. We, we react. We have a short fuse. There's more door slamming than kind words being heard in our home. And if that's you, life, life's too short for that. Let me encourage you to, to get help. And Friday nights here at the church, we have something called Life's Healing Choices. We all have hurts, habits, and hangups. And on Friday nights, one, one place and one opportunity for you to just begin to work on that. Solving life, life's hurts that took 30, 40, 50 years for me to develop is not going to be solved in an eight-week program. But take a step to begin to identify and work. Right? If you have an anger problem, everybody around you knows it. Whether they've told you or not, they all know it. And they don't like being around you. And for some of us, they're like, well, why aren't my why don't my kids call me? Why don't they come around? Why don't they show up? For some of us, the reality is because I'm a time bomb waiting to explode. Can you be a follower of Jesus and have anger problems? Yes, you can. God loves you, He's patient with you, and He wants you to identify this and, and to work on it. If there's things we've reacted to recently, seek reconciliation. If, if we lost it, I mean, it happens so quickly, right? Someone cuts us off on the highway. You were wondering if I was going to go there. Traffic. Traffic. Within... 15 minutes driving to work, right? You can go off on 10 people who you've never met and you have no idea what they're walking through. You have no idea what they're going. And God's saying, as a follower of Jesus, we're to be the most patient people on the highway. I know this is getting personal. I'm not going to ask you to put a Boulder Mountain bumper sticker on your car. We're not going that far. But what would it look like, even in the traffic, to say, you go first? And pray for them. Because God, I have no idea what that person's going through. Leave yourself some margin. Don't agree to do 100 things a day that you know 
is going to be difficult. You know you, you're going to be angry because you agreed to do something. Now you don't have the margin of the time. If you don't have the time, don't go through the drive through if you don't have a half hour, right? And I, I, we're joking about this, but these are big things in your life too. There's, there's two types of things that we're, we're talking about here today. There's the temporal things, the things like traffic and drive throughs But then there's the eternal things. There's the things God's asking us to hang in there and be patient and wait and trust him for sometimes 30, 40, 50 years. Are you able to do that? You can trust him. The promises that he's said and given to you, you could take it to the bank. But he didn't give us a, a date on the calendar for it. I pray that we would be known as patient people. That we would stand as our Savior did. That he stood under pressure. He didn't react. Jesus was patient with life where life took him. Life ended for him around age 33. He was patient with the people all around him, even at the cross. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He was patient with his father. Right? The perfect community he said, God, if there's any other way, but if not, I will continue on. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you that our Savior lived out perfect patience with people in his life, in immense suffering, and with his relationship with you. Father, thank you that your son came to live the life that none of us could live and died the death that none of us have to die. I thank you that you have been so very patient with us. Father, I pray in this moment that the things that we're waiting for to, to be accomplished, you'd give us more patience. You'd give us perseverance. You'd give us the ability to keep going, keep standing up as, as Jesus did. We look forward to your son returning. We long for that day. We look forward to that day. And we trust that that day is going to happen. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.